the episode on Operation Charmwood, we follow the British Canadian soldiers in their combat to take Khan coming from the north. And they got into Khan, but they were stopped here at the River Orne. And the Germans held the other side of the river for another 10 days. General Bradley said that with the firepower and the manpower, the Allies could outmove the Germans in the moving battle. But it's still taken six weeks to take Saint Lo. 500 yards a day in the last week. In a meeting on the 10th of July between Montgomery and Bradley about the logistical problems after Sherbrooke being destroyed by the Germans and the Mulberry Harbour American being destroyed by a storm, Bradley reported that he had a plan for a breakout and once St. Lowe was taken, he would use the straight road from St. Lowe to Perrier as the start line and be a massive bombing raid to help the soldiers advance. Now once he got the go-ahead from Montgomery, he also got the support from Lee Mallory for the use of 2,246 bombers in this bombing raid. Later, General Dempsey proposed that he had a breakout plan by sending the British troops to the east of Caen and heading towards Falaise. Now Montgomery was against this change of plan that he had for the Americans swinging around the hinge of Caen. But Dempsey insisted that it would help the Americans in their breakout by bringing more Germans into Caen. So finally Montgomery came round to this idea and Dempsey could organise it. So the 7th, 11th and the Guards Armoured Divisions were going to be taken out of the front line to prepare for this attack. Now Montgomery laid out the objective. Two army will operate with a strong armoured force east of the River Rhone. The immediate objective will be the plateau south of Caen. Dempsey relayed uh, slightly different orders. It was that 8th Corps will track southwards and establish an armoured division in Bretville, Vimont and Falaise. That was 13 miles more than Montgomery suggested. And Montgomery issued a corrective. They were to form a bridgehead over the Orne through Caen and destroy the German armour and personnel as a preliminary to a possible exploitation of success. Now that last line left Dempsey still having his idea of getting to Falaise. So there the confusion was bred. The open country south of Caen was thought to be good tank country. Tanks had been first invented in the First World War and first used at Combray where they were used effectively. But there they were having to cross trenches and craters. So that was bad tank country. So it became tank doctrine that any countryside with no trenches and craters was good tank country. But we'll see it didn't quite work out like that. Now at the meeting with Bradley when he mentioned Cobra and his massive bombing raid, Dempsey quite liked the idea so he decided to use it for Operation Goodwood. Now the reason to use it was slightly different. The three armoured divisions to be used had to cross the canal and the river from the west to the east before they attacked the Germans. And so the supporting artillery would be to the west of the river and the canal. Not well placed to support the tanks. So the massive bombing raid would lay the ground for a successful attack. Now stress was common among soldiers in general. Tank has actually less chance of becoming a casualty than infantry did. Their armour plating protected them from rifle bullets and machine guns and shrapnel. They were living in between explosive shells and highly combustible gasoline and the confined space. For one tanker, the last straw was when he was just about to eat his tasty stew of potatoes. A German shell came in and showered it with muck. And he ran in all directions, he, he went berserk. His comrades had to pin him down. Steel Brownlee bawled out his Firefly commander, who was hanging behind them, and got there late. The Firefly commander <laughs> said, nobody's ever called me a coward before. Steel Brownlee just ignored it and walked away. Then he heard the scuffle behind him. 
he turned around to see that one of the soldiers was tackling the man he'd bawled at and he pulled his pistol out and he was going to shoot him in the back. But uh, afterwards they got on okay. A gunner was sat in his seat and then a command came through the intercom. Target ahead, 40 yards, fire! So he grabbed his machine gun handles and looked through the periscope. All he could see was Captain Lee. And he replied, what, what do you mean? He said, fire! He said, balls, come and fire yourself. Uh, General O'Connor commanded the 8th Corps, which was going to carry out the operation. He'd beaten the Italians in North Africa, but then he'd been taken prisoner by a German patrol. And he spent two and a half years in the prison and war camp in Italy until Mussolini fell and he managed to escape. But he'd missed out on the improvements in tank doctrine in that time. Three armoured divisions were set to carry out Operation Goodwood. There was the 11th, the 7th and the Guards armoured divisions. The 7th armoured was the famous Desert Rats and they'd been involved in the debacle at Villa Bocage. The 11th armoured division had been involved in Epsom and the Guards had just arrived in Normandy. Now you might wonder why we're at Pegasus Bridge. You might have recognised it up there. Pegasus Bridge is where D-Day started and it's where Operation Goodwood started. Now the Allies had good intelligence compared with the Germans, but it wasn't flawless. The beginning of July was a lean time for ultra intercepts and the prisoners they captured came from the front lines and so they gave information about the front lines. So Dempsey didn't know the real force or the depth of the German defences. On the German right there was a 346th division, on their left was the 272nd division and in the middle was the 16th Luftwaffe division. But they didn't know where the 12th SS, the 1st SS or the 21st Panzers were. They believed they'd been badly mauled in the previous battles and had retired to lick their wounds. They were, however, just behind them front lines and they were capable of coming into action on the day. On the Borgubus Ridge, or Borgubu, or Bugabus as the British called it, there was a 21st Panzer artillery. And behind that was a line of anti-aircraft guns. And then behind that was the 12th SS. The plan for Goodwood was it would be preceded by a massive bomb attack between Columbelle and Troan, and also on the Borgabu Ridge. This was the first time there'd been such a massive air support for ground troops. There was a risk of friendly fire. So all the tankers were told to paint the tops of their turrets white. Now this was a problem for the M10 Achilles because their turret was open. And so they painted three foot square white on the top of their hull. The Royal Engineers would be clearing paths 1500 yards wide through the minefield laid down by the 51st Highlanders to protect their bridgehead. Since D-Day, the bridgehead east of the Orne had been held by the Airborne, Commandos and the 51st Highlanders. As the engineers were working to clear these paths through the mines, the three armoured divisions were going to have to cross Pegasus Bridge. What? That's not possible. Now, in fact, they built four other bridges, Bailey Bridges, two across the canal and two across the River Orne. There's actually a monument here. It commemorates a bridge that was built in September, the Pontoon Bridge. And on the River Orne there's remnants of one of the Bailey Bridges just near the Horsa Bridge. They had to wait for the morning of the attack to cross the river and the canal Otherwise the Germans would know what was happening. They had a pretty good idea anyway. Because the Germans could see from the towers of the steelworks at Columbell, just three miles away, had a very good view of what the British were doing. Now, the preparations to get three armoured divisions into the battlefield started on the 16th of July. 
a Spitfire was shot down, overflying the battleground. And because he didn't want the Germans to get hold of it, the whole area around where the plane fell was inundated with artillery to obliterate the plane and everything in it. Now, secrecy wasn't really pertinent. Septi Trish knew that there was going to be an attack onto the Borgaboo Ridge, whether it came from the east of the Orn or from Hill 112 or through Khan. And from the steelworks, which is just to the east of the river at Column Bell, just the east of Khan, the Germans could see the Bailey Bridges going up here. Now on the night of the 16th to 17th, the Luftwaffe took some flare-lit photos of the Bailey Bridges. So Rommel was informed of an imminent attack across the canal. Now that was why on the 17th, Rommel came from La roche Guyon, where he had his headquarters, to inspect the preparations. And it was on the way back to La roche Guyon that he was attacked by a Spitfire and badly wounded and that was the last time he was in Normandy. On the night of the 17th, the three divisions started crossing the six bridges across the river and the canal. Now we're here at Ecoville, looks like Escoville. Yes, it's silent. The line of mines came along here and there were 20 openings made. One of them was just here next to Ecoville and the three Royal Tank Regiment came through this one. The bombing started with a thousand Lancasters bombing at 3,000 feet. They were just above the uh, light flak level. They had delayed fuses on the bombs to make craters. Many Mark IVs and Tigers were destroyed in this bombing. As the dust settled, a second wave of American bombers came over. They were flying at seven to 8,000 feet. They were using fragmentation bombs to reduce craters so as not to impede the advance. Now, thunderbolts and typhoons could knock out tanks with their rockets, but studies showed that only 4% of claimed hits were actually real ones. But the sight of jabos, as the Germans called them, could make crews abandon their tanks. They were so scared of them, they were constantly being attacked throughout the Battle of Normandy. A near miss could immobilise a tank. Damage to it or muck in the tracks could stop it moving. Now on the skyline, just in line with the road going up, you can see the top of the tower of the steelworks. That's one tower that still remains. There were four of those cooling towers. Each of the three armoured divisions would take its turn to come through the lanes cleared by the engineers. The 11th armoured would come through first. They would take the right flank, Bra, to Rock and Core. And then the guards would come through. They would go on the left flank, Cagny and Vimont. Then the 7th would break through and head to the Borgaboo Ridge the commander, Pitt Roberts, was concerned that they were to take Cagny and Demoville because that would take men off of his unit and there'd be fewer to carry on. So after he complained a bit, the 7th were finally just to mask Cagny and carry on. But that would still leave just half of his unit to advance. Behind Ecoville, there's the Bavant Ridge. The Germans could see what they were doing from there as well. On each flank there were supporting actions. On the 15th of July there was Operation Green Line towards Everesi, that's Hill 112, and then Operation Pomegranate towards Noyer Bocage. As Goodwood started, the Canadians started Operation Atlantic they would go down the east bank of the canal and break out from Caen across the Orne in town. And then the first corps, they would attack through the Bavant towards Roanne. But we'll concentrate on the three armoured divisions. Now the 11th and the Gas divisions had Shermans 
as the Sherman wasn't designed to fight other tanks. They had tank killers with them, usually M10 Achilles. It was a Sherman chassis with different bodywork and a 17 pound uh, anti-tank gun on it, which could knock out a Tiger. Now the British had also adapted the Sherman by adding a 17 pound uh, anti-tank gun and they called that a Firefly. So in a troop of four tanks, they'd have one Firefly. Now the 7th Armoured Division, they had it Cromwells, but also Fireflies. So for three Cromwells, there would be a Firefly with them. Now the Cromwell was a fast tank. That's one thing you can say about it. Otherwise it wasn't much better or worse than a Sherman. You had one disadvantage. From a distance and in the haze, you could take it for a Mark IV or a Tiger. And sometimes they were fired on by their comrades. Each division had a reconnaissance regiment equipped with Cromwells and also sometimes a light Stuart tank, which the British called a Honey. Now the Stuart tank with its 37mm gun was pretty useless. So on many tanks they took the turret off so they could have more room to move. At the same time as the attack started, the artillery barrage started. A buck kite of A squadron, he wondered why he could see tanks in front of him reversing. Then he realised there were shells falling amongst them. But the artillery sorted out their range and got it to 100 yards in front of the first tanks. The lead regiment of the 11th Armoured Division was the three Royal Tank Regiment. They advanced in a box formation with the HQ in the middle. The Royal Tank Regiment followed this path from Ecoville towards Couverville. Over there we can see the chimney of the cement works which is near Ranville and over that way the ridge of Bavent Wood. We're looking northeast there. They skirted round the rubble of Couverville and then past the woods of Demerville to the right and the remains of Touffreville on their left. Bill Close remembers, he said we roared on through the dust and we saw dazed and shaken Germans giving themselves up. We just indicated that they should go to the rear. They passed the German gun crew next to a working gun. There were just two days to use it, so they just carried on. Now we're here by what was the Caen Vimont Railway, it's disappeared now. In the distance they can now see the Borgabu Ridge. Over to the right you can see the tower of the steelworks and further over the hospital at Caen. So the first objective was the Caen Vimont railway line. This was thought to be an insignificant obstacle. But it was on a six foot bank. Now tanks could get across that, but half tracks and wheel vehicles couldn't. Fortunately, Avrays had been supplied to deal with unforeseen obstacles, and Avrays came up to blow paths through the bank that could continue. Now the artillery barrage let up for some time, for one thing that would get organised, and they were to change direction to go to the southwest. That's that way now and the artillery also had to change their settings to follow the new direction. The fragmentation bombs dropped by the Americans had immobilised most of the guns, but the British found a German gun here, anti-tank gun, just by this level crossing house. The Germans had sabotaged it and abandoned it. Now the barrage started up again, but because of the delay getting across the bank, the tanks were getting behind the barrage, they had to rush to try and catch up. Then they came up to another obstacle, a hedge that they just couldn't smash through. So that to break open openings, and then there was a traffic jam getting through the openings. Approaching Le Menil Fremantel near Cagny, they were at the limit of the supporting artillery. 
The Germans were starting to recover and prepare their camouflage guns. The tankers had orders to ignore these and carry on. It was only their speed that protected them. Some Shermans and Stuarts were already brewing up. The next obstacle was the paris Caen railway line, which is still active today. It wasn't such an obstacle because between cuttings and embankments, the railway line was at ground level. If Allied intelligence had been correct, they would have made a breakthrough of the German lines here. Their third Royal Tank Regiment was outside the range of the supporting artillery now, but sextons mounted with 25 pounder guns could give them support. So they came up to the railway that went from the steelworks down to the iron mines. And this was on a steep bank, and even tanks would have a hard job getting over that. So the only way through was through underpasses like this one. So Bill Close ordered the men to go through. And nobody moved. After what they'd gone through, nobody dared run the gauntlet to this. So Bill Close waved his berry in the air and he went through. As he went through, he thought this is a good place for mines. But it was too late to worry about that now. And he went through. And he came out the other side into lovely peaceful landscape. No guns firing. So the rest of the tanks followed him through. They could now see Borgaboo Ridge, 